correspondent, Roger Mudd. Good evening. President Carter is about to be introduced to the Congress for his third State of the Union address, and it will be unlike the first two, not only in tone, but also in content. It will not really be a report on the State of the Union, but on the state of relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. And it will not really be a catalog of how great things are, but how grim things might get. The President has just about passed the threshold of the House of Representatives Mr. chamber. Speaker, this the is President's the doorkeeper. Cabinet. James Malloy introducing the President. <laughs> Preceded by the Carter Cabinet, Secretary of State Vance, UN Ambassador, Treasury Secretary, Defense Secretary, H-E-W, the whole group is here this evening. The doorkeeper, James Malloy, standing at the <laughs> rear of the House aisle to introduce President Carter, who comes to the Congress this evening, of course, with a strong political victory from Iowa. There's the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Berger of the United States, Potter Stewart, Byron White. <laughs> the president is a little late this evening. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. This is a very strong welcome. It's not been like this every time he's come to the Hill. Members of the Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the 96th Congress, fellow citizens, 
This last few months has not been an easy time for any of us. As we meet tonight, it has never been more clear that the state of our union depends on the state of the world. And tonight, as throughout our own generation, freedom and peace in the world depend on the state of our union. The 1980s have been born in turmoil, strife, and change. This is a time of challenge to our interests and our values. And it's a time to test our wisdom and our skills. At this time in Iran, 50 Americans are still held captive, innocent victims of terrorism and anarchy. Also at this moment, massive Soviet troops are attempting to subjugate the fiercely independent and deeply religious people of Afghanistan. These two acts, one of international terrorism and one of military aggression, present a serious challenge to the United States of America and indeed to all the nations of the world. Together, we will meet these threats to peace. I'm determined that the United States will remain the strongest of all nations, but our power will never be used to initiate a threat to the security of any nation or to the rights of any human being. We seek to be and to remain secure, a nation at peace in a stable world. But to be secure, we must face the world as it is. Three basic developments have helped to shape our challenges. The steady growth and increased projection of Soviet military power beyond its own borders, the overwhelming dependence of the Western democracies on oil supplies from the Middle East, and the press of social and religious and economic and political change in the many nations of the developing world, exemplified by the revolution in Iran. Each of these factors is important in its own right. Each interacts with the others. All must be faced together, squarely and courageously. We will face these challenges, and we will meet them with the best that is in us, and we will not fail. In response to the abhorrent act in Iran, our nation has never been aroused and unified so greatly in peacetime. Our position is clear. The United States will not yield to blackmail. We continue to pursue these specific goals. First, to protect the present and long-range interests of the United States. Secondly, to preserve the lives of the American hostages and to secure as quickly as possible their safe release. If possible, to avoid bloodshed, which might further endanger the lives of our fellow citizens. To enlist the help of other nations in condemning this act of violence, which is shocking and violates the moral and the legal standards of a civilized world. And also to convince and to persuade the Iranian leaders that the real danger to their nation lies in the North, in the Soviet Union, and from the Soviet troops now in Afghanistan, and that the unwarranted Iranian quarrel with the United States hampers their response to this far greater danger to them. If the American hostages are harmed, a severe price will be paid.
We will never rest until every one of the American hostages are released. But now we face a broader and more fundamental challenge in this region because of the recent military action of the Soviet Union. Now, as during the last three and a half decades, the relationship between our country, the United States of America, and the Soviet Union is the most critical factor in determining whether the world will live at peace or be engulfed in global conflict. Since the end of the Second World War, America has led other nations in meeting the challenge of mounting Soviet power. This has not been a simple or a static relationship. Between us, there has been cooperation, there has been competition, and at times, there has been confrontation. In the 1940s, we took the lead in creating the Atlantic Alliance in response to the Soviet Union's suppression and then consolidation of its East European empire and the resulting threat of the Warsaw Pact to Western Europe. In the 1950s, we helped to contain further Soviet challenges in Korea and in the Middle East, and we rearmed to assure the continuation of that containment. In the 1960s, we met the Soviet challenges in Berlin and we faced the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we sought to engage the Soviet Union in the important task of moving beyond the Cold War and away from confrontation. And in the 1970s, three American presidents negotiated with the Soviet leaders in attempts to halt the growth of the nuclear arms race. We sought to establish rules of behavior that would reduce the risks of conflict. And we searched for areas of cooperation that could make our relations reciprocal and productive, not only for the sake of our two nations, but for the security and peace of the entire world. In all these actions, we have maintained two commitments, to be ready to meet any challenge by Soviet military power and to develop ways to resolve disputes and to keep the peace. Preventing nuclear war is the foremost responsibility of the two superpowers. That's why we've negotiated the strategic arms limitation talks, treaties SALT I and SALT II, especially now in a time of great tension Observing the mutual constraints imposed by the terms of these treaties will be in the best interest of both countries and will help to preserve world peace. I will consult, consult very closely with the Congress on this matter as we strive to control nuclear weapons. That effort to control nuclear weapons will not be abandoned. We superpowers also have the responsibility to exercise restraint in the use of our great military force. The integrity and the independence of weaker nations must not be threatened. They must know that in our presence, they are secure. But now the Soviet Union has taken a radical and an aggressive new step. It's using its great military power against a relatively defenseless nation. The implications of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan could pose the most serious threat to the peace since the Second World War. The vast majority of nations on Earth have condemned this latest Soviet attempt to extend its colonial domination of others and have demanded the immediate withdrawal of Soviet troops. The Muslim world is especially and justifiably outraged by this aggression against an Islamic people. No action of a world power has ever been so quickly and so overwhelmingly condemned. 
But verbal condemnation is not enough. The Soviet Union must pay a concrete price for their aggression. While this invasion continues, we and the other nations of the world cannot conduct business as usual with the Soviet Union. That's why the United States has imposed stiff economic penalties on the Soviet Union. I will not issue any permits for Soviet ships to fish in the, co in the coastal waters of the United States. I've cut Soviet access to high technology equipment and to agricultural products I've limited other commerce with the Soviet Union, and I've asked our allies and friends to join with us in restraining their own trade with the Soviets and not to replace our own embargoed items. And I have notified the Olympic Committee that with Soviet invading forces in Afghanistan, neither the American people nor I will support sending an Olympic team to Moscow. The Soviet Union is going to have to answer some basic questions. Will it help promote a more stable international environment in which its own legitimate peaceful concerns can be pursued? Or will it continue to expand its military power far beyond its genuine security needs and use that power for colonial conquest? The Soviet Union must realize that its decision to use military force in Afghanistan will be costly to every political and economic relationship it values. <laughs> the region which is now threatened by Soviet troops in Afghanistan is of great strategic importance. It contains more than two thirds of the world's exportable oil. The Soviet effort to dominate Afghanistan has brought Soviet military forces to within 300 miles of the Indian Ocean and close to the Straits of Hormuz, a waterway through which most of the world's oil must flow. The Soviet Union is now attempting to consolidate a strategic position, therefore, that poses a grave threat to the free movement of Middle East oil. This situation demands careful thought, steady nerves, and resolute action, not only for this year, but for many years to come. It demands collective efforts to meet this new threat to security in the Persian Gulf and in Southwest Asia. It demands the participation of all those who rely on oil from the Middle East and who are concerned with global peace and stability. And it demands consultation and close cooperation with countries in the area which might be threatened. Meeting this challenge will take national will, diplomatic and political wisdom, economic sacrifice, and of course, military capability. We must call on the best that is in us to preserve the security of this crucial region. Let our position be absolutely clear. An attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interest of the United States of America. <laughs> and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary including military force.
During the past three years, you have joined with me to improve our own security and the prospects for peace, not only in the vital oil-producing area of the Persian Gulf region, but around the world. We've increased annually our real commitment for defense, and we will sustain this increase of effort throughout the five-year defense program. It's imperative that Congress approve this strong defense budget for 1981, encompassing a 5% real growth in authorizations without any reduction. We are improving We're also improving our capability to deploy U.S. military forces rapidly to distant areas. We've helped to strengthen NATO and our other alliances. And recently, we and other NATO members have decided to develop and to deploy modernized intermediate range nuclear forces to meet an unwarranted and increased threat from the nuclear weapons of the Soviet Union. We're working with our allies to prevent conflict in the Middle East the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel is a notable achievement which represents a strategic asset for America and which also enhances prospects for regional and world peace. We are now engaged in further negotiations to provide full autonomy for the people of the West Bank and Gaza to resolve the Palestinian issue in all its aspects and to preserve the peace and security of Israel. Let no one doubt our commitment to the security of Israel. In a few days, we will observe an historic event when Israel makes another major withdrawal from the Sinai and when ambassadors will be exchanged between Israel and Egypt. We've also expanded our own sphere of friendship. Our deep commitment to human rights and to meeting human needs has improved our relationship with much of the third world. Our decision to normalize relations with the People's Republic of China will help to preserve peace and stability in Asia and in, West, and in the Western Pacific. We've increased and strengthened our naval presence in the Indian Ocean, and we are now making arrangements for key naval and air facilities to be used by our forces in the region of Northeast Africa and the Persian Gulf. We've reconfirmed our 1959 agreement to help Pakistan preserve its independence and its integrity. The United States will take action consistent with our own laws to assist Pakistan in resisting any outside aggression. And I'm asking the Congress specifically to reaffirm this agreement. I'm also working along with the leaders of other nations to provide additional military and economic aid for Pakistan. That request will come to you in just a few days. In the weeks ahead, we will further strengthen political and military ties with other nations in the region. We believe that there are no irreconcilable differences between us and any Islamic nation. We respect the faith of Islam, and we are ready to cooperate with all Muslim countries. Finally, we are prepared to work with other countries in the region to share a cooperative security framework that respects differing values and political beliefs, yet which enhances the independence, security, and prosperity of all. All these efforts combined emphasize our dedication to defend and preserve the vital interests of the region and of the nation which we represent and those of our allies in Europe and the Pacific, and also in the parts of the world which have such great strategic importance to us, stretching especially through the Middle East and Southwest Asia. With your help, I will pursue these efforts with vigor and with determination. You and I will act as necessary to protect and to preserve our nation's security. The men and women of America's armed forces are on duty tonight in many parts of the world. I'm proud of the job they're doing, and I know you share that pride. 
I believe that our volunteer forces are adequate for current defense needs. And I hope that it will not become necessary to impose a draft. However, we must be prepared for that possibility. For this reason, I have determined that the selective service system must now be revitalized. I will send legislation and budget proposals to the Congress next month so that we can begin registration and then meet future mobilization needs rapidly if they arise. We also need clear and quick passage of a new charter to define the legal authority and accountability of our intelligence agencies. We will guarantee that abuses do not recur, but we must tighten our controls on sensitive intelligence information, and we need to remove unwarranted restraints on America's ability to collect intelligence. <laughs> the decade ahead will be a time of rapid change as nations everywhere seek to deal with new problems and age-old tensions. But America need have no fear. We can thrive in a world of change if we remain true to our values and actively engaged in promoting world peace. We will continue to work as we have for peace in the Middle East and Southern Africa. We will continue to build our ties with, de with developing nations respecting and helping to strengthen their national independence, which they have struggled so hard to achieve. And we will continue to support the growth of democracy and the protection of human rights. In repressive regimes, popular frustrations often have no outlet except through violence. But when peoples and their governments can approach their problems together through open democratic methods, the basis for stability and peace is far more solid and far more enduring. That is why that our support for human rights in other countries is in our own national interest as well as part of our own national character. Peace. A peace that preserves freedom remains America's first goal. In the coming years, as a mighty nation, we will continue to pursue peace. But to be strong abroad, we must be strong at home. And in order to be strong, we must continue to face up to the difficult issues that confront us as a nation today. The crises in Iran and Afghanistan have dramatized a very important lesson. Our excessive dependence on foreign oil is a clear and present danger to our nation's security. <laughs> the need has never been more urgent. At long last, we must have a clear, comprehensive energy policy for the United States. As you well know, I have been working with the Congress in a concentrated and persistent way over the past three years to meet this need. We have made progress together, but Congress must act promptly now to complete final action on this vital energy legislation. Our nation will then have a major con conservation effort, important initiatives to develop solar power, realistic pricing based on the true value of oil, strong incentives for the production of coal and other fossil fuels in the United States, and our nation's most massive peacetime investment in the development of synthetic fuels. The American people are making progress in energy conservation. Last year, we reduced overall petroleum consumption by 8% and gasoline consumption by 5%, below what it was 
the year before. Now we must do more. After consultation with the governors, we will set gasoline conservation goals for each of the 50 states, and I will make them mandatory if these goals are not met. I've established an import ceiling for 1980 of 8.2 million barrels a day, well below the level of foreign oil purchases in 1977. I expect our imports to be much lower than this, but the ceiling will be enforced by an oil import fee if necessary. I'm prepared to lower these imports still further if the other oil-consuming countries will join us in a fair and mutual reduction. If we have a serious shortage, I will not hesitate to impose mandatory gasoline rationing immediately. The sing single biggest factor in the inflation rate last year, the increase in the inflation rate last year, was from one cause, the skyrocketing prices of OPEC oil. We must take whatever actions are necessary to reduce our dependence on foreign oil and at the same time reduce inflation. As individuals and as families, few of us can produce energy by ourselves, but all of us can conserve energy, every one of us, every day of our lives. Tonight I call on you, in fact all the people of America, to help our nation conserve energy, eliminate waste, make 1980 indeed a year of energy conservation. <laughs> of course, we must take other actions to strengthen our nation's economy. First, we will continue to reduce the deficit and then to balance the federal budget. <laughs> Second, as we continue to work with business to hold down prices, we'll build also on the historic national accord with organized labor to restrain pay increases in a fair fight against inflation. Third, we will continue our successful efforts to cut paperwork and to dismantle unnecessary government regulation. Fourth, we will continue our progress in providing jobs for America, concentrating on a major new program to provide training and work for our young people, especially minority youth. It has been said that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. We will give our young people new hope for jobs and a better life in the 1980s. And fifth, we must use the decade of the 1980s to attack the basic structural weaknesses and problems in our economy through measures to increase productivity, savings, and investment. With these energy and economic policies, we will make America even stronger at home in this decade, just as our foreign and defense policies will make us stronger and safer throughout the world. We will never abandon our struggle for a just and a decent society here at home. That's the heart of America. And it's a source of our ability to inspire other people to defend their own rights abroad. Our material resources, great as they are, are limited. Our problems are too complex for simple slogans or for quick solutions. We cannot solve them without effort and sacrifice. Walter Lippmann once reminded us, you took the good things for granted. Now you must earn them again. For every right that you cherish, you have a duty which you must fulfill. For every good which you wish to preserve, you will have to sacrifice your comfort and your ease. There is nothing for nothing any longer. Our challenges are formidable, but there's a new spirit of unity and resolve in our country. We move into the 1980s with confidence 
and hope and a bright vision of the America we want, an America strong and free, an America at peace, an America with equal rights for all citizens and for women guaranteed in the United States Constitution. An America with jobs and good health and good education for every citizen. An America with a clean and bountiful life in our cities and on our farms. An America that helps to feed the world. An America secure in filling its own energy needs. An America of justice, tolerance, and compassion. For this vision to come true, we must sacrifice. But this national commitment will be an exciting enterprise that will unify our people. Together as one people, let us work to build our strength at home. And together as one indivisible union, let us seek peace and security throughout the world. Together, let us make of this time of challenge and danger a decade of national resolve and of brave achievement. Thank you very much. President Carter is taking full advantage of what must be very sweet music to his ears this evening, slowly making his way out of the House of Representatives, receiving the congratulations of his cabinet and the clerks and aides of the House of Representatives and the Supreme Court. He is escorted by the two sergeants at arms of the House and the Senate, the majority and minority leaders, and some members of his own uh, state of Georgia, the Georgia delegation. Everybody wants to touch a president who is riding a crest now. But they all shook his hands when he came in, and now they're shaking it as he goes out. This is the third State of the Union. I think it's been his sixth visit to the Hill to address a joint session. <laughs> and this was by far his most rousing welcome. They're clogging the door to get a grab at it. So the president has left the House of Representatives concluding his third State of the Union speech, the speech